Mark. Hey, we are live. Welcome to Real People, Real Health. I am your host, Jay Rothman, and I am excited to have in a studio from San Juan Capistrano, Southern California, Jacqueline Coburn. Welcome to the studio. Thank you, Jay. Nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you also. We, uh, we were introduced by a friend in common not too long ago. I had a guest on on one of my other platforms, Real People, Real Stories, and that was uh, Mary Hill, who I've known for a number of years now. Uh, and so we met through Mary Hill. And through that introduction, I had uh, the opportunity to hear indirectly that you had a backstory. We all have a story to tell. It just comes down to when we're ready to share our truths uh, or not. Um, but in any event, as I wait for uh, some people to join us live, um, I'm going to invite you to, uh, well, I kind of put it out there on a marketing piece uh, that uh, your backstory in, involves cancer. You had been diagnosed and a number of years ago, about eight years ago, with breast cancer. And not only did you have the diagnosis not once, you had it a second time and you went through that process the second go round, and you stumbled into round three. And uh, right now you are uh, July, I believe of 18, you were diagnosed with your third time of having cancer. And so I thought your story was um, an amazing story of, uh, well, there's just so much to it. I thought it would be beautiful to invite you into the studio have you uh, share your backstory and uh, we'll go from there. So while I, uh, while I put out the show and some different channels that we are, uh, that bring us on live through their feed, I'd like to invite you to share a little bit about your backstory. Um, what do you think precipitated led up to the cancer? And then we'll get into uh, the timeline and, uh, and what that has looked like for you since uh, about 2011 when it all began. Oh, wow. So backstory, I mean, if we were to condense it to just the 2011, that would be really simple, but um, I don't have any cancer whatsoever running in my family. No breast cancer. I had had with the first diagnosis and surgery, a lumpectomy removal of the tumor on the right side of my breast and they did genetic testing on that tumor and there is no propensity throughout my family lines and there was no propensity for that tumor to re or the cancer to reemerge to reappear so the you know i thought okay so 2011 that's it um but it came back and um, I, I always knew what the emotional hit was because it doesn't run in my family the first thing I did was look at what is the emotional cause. Well, emotionally, um, breast, this is our women, is the extension of our heart right here at our breast. That's our heart. That's where we feel is in our breasts. And I had taken a massive hit, emotional hit with, um, I'll keep it short and sweet, but for years and years and years, um, I left a marriage when my kids were little. And the father of my children immediately married. Um, I didn't realize that I had married a sociopath until I divorced him. And he also married uh, even worse in my own diagnosis than he was. Um, and so they both systematically early on started to brainwash my kids into hating me. So it's called parental alienation syndrome. And it was a great many years, a good eight, 10 years. It'd be well beyond the years of reasonable, you know, ex-spouse being pissed at the leaving parent. You know, it usually is like a year or two of somebody being really mad at somebody. But this just kept going and escalating to beyond measure to the point where my kids for three years, my girl and my boy, would look at me every time I would pick them up from school every other week and they would start hating on me. They would yell and scream for three years straight, I hate you. 
I don't even want to see your face. Our stepmother is a much better mother than you are. You're not even our parent for three years. And so every time I would hear this, it would rip my heart out. And uh, with no cancer history, and my oncologist, when I was first diagnosed, he said, you know, time is on your side. You're going to worry that you're not having surgery but right away, like right away. But don't worry because this cancer has been in your body for about three years. You have time. And three years from the time that he said that was three years prior, I had lost, on paper, I had lost custody of my children in court. Um, so I, I went to being the mom of seeing my kids every other weekend and maybe every other Wednesday, only if they wanted, because they'd been brainwashed into saying to me that mom, I don't want to hang out with you. And I don't have to, cause daddy said, I don't need to, if I'm 12 years old, I can make my own decision. And so every time that I saw them, even my scheduled time was ripped in half because um, their father or stepmother would schedule some kind of fun party every time I was to see them every other weekend wasn't even my weekend so yeah I was ripped to shreds my soul was torn apart I was literally seeing myself as Humpty Dumpty on the wall taped together I just taped my soul together and the only way I could possibly hold it together after such heartbreak. And then the cancer diagnosis was no surprise, none whatsoever. And um, with 2011, um, three days after I had received that first diagnosis, my mom died and she was my best friend. Mm. And so at that time, it was so much like double whammy. I was run over by a freight train and then, and then, and then it backed up and ran over me again and again and again. Um, and in that time, actually, I've, I found my mom's passing, even as my best friend was a blessing because I was able to purge and let loose all sorts of dark, just sorrow, you know, grief out of my body. And I knew that she was holding space for me on the other side. I just, it was just a whole lot to handle all at once. I want to take a moment here um, to actually thank you for, for joining me this evening. And uh, I'd like to honor you because it takes a lot of courage to step into the studio and share your backstory, especially when there are parts of it that are painful. And um, in speaking, it, it can bring us back to those emotions that we felt, you know, even, even though we do, we may do some healing around those emotions and feelings and around that time frame. Uh, but when we go back in thoughts or when we go back and sharing that part of the story, it, it can bring us back to a large extent. And so I uh, just want to acknowledge you and, and thank you for having the courage to step into the studio tonight. I, I believe that the reason you are here is um, partially for yourself because there's some opportunity for some spontaneous healing to take place. It happens quite often. But more importantly, it's, it's for others that may be listening to us live or in replay that are in, a, in the middle of going through um, a diagnosis like breast cancer or other types of terminal diseases that uh, are impacting their life or a loved one's life. And, and perhaps there's something that you're gonna share in, in our conversation today that's going to impact, that's gonna bring some hope, inspiration, uh, some courage to somebody that needs to hear it in this moment. So, um, Thank you for, for going there and sharing this part of the story, which I know is um, it's no matter how much work we do when it comes to alienation of our own children, um, it's a very, very, very painful process to go through and to accept that what happened in fact happened. Um, so 
To fast forward, it's now 2011. You've got a diagnosis. And tell me more. Well, I dove deep into, I think the first, my first question, the first thing that comes to mind with every of the three diagnoses, very number one factor is what do I want? Do I want to live or do I want to die? That's the very first decision to make. And first diagnosis, my kids were still in high school. I, I have to live. It's not even a question. I'm here. I'm raising my babies. I must be here still. But that, I believe, is a question that every single one of us needs to answer in order to just start with clarity. Then then we can work from there. So once I decided, okay, I want to live, it was, you know, it was a moment, but it, it, it took probably a good three days. When I started to ask that question, it was, you know, I, all I did was dive into grieving my mom. So it was about three, two, three weeks after grieving my mom, I realized, oh shit, I actually have cancer and I have this little thing to deal with now. What do I want? And so that's when the answer came in. Um, the next thing that I did was I dealt with the fear. And this is every single time. Not, diagnosis one, two, and three is there's so much fear around cancer for the individual and for the family to deal with. But I also, what I realized is the first diagnosis, when I looked at that, oh my gosh, I've been through quite a life, a lot of trauma in my life. I mean, more than most anybody I've ever, ever talked to. And so I know fear, this doesn't make any sense. I was thinking, how is it that I have this much fear in my body around this topic? I mean, I have been through so many fires. How is this little fear thing so um, strangling me? And when I really started to ask that question, it took about two or three days for the answer to come in, but I was just asking it constantly. What is this? It's so freaking heavy. What is this? And then I got the answer. It's the fear in the collective. It's not my own. And the minute I realized, holy crap, the collective is so embedded in cancer fear and cancer equals death to anyone on the planet. I don't know how you could be on this planet and not equate cancer to death. We, all of us have somebody we've lost to cancer or many somebodies. And so, yeah, when something means death, that's a lot of fear. But I realized it's the collective that is so crushing in the fear zone. I was able to just literally, oh, it's the collective, like a big cloud. And so I stepped out from underneath the cloud of the collective and realized that, oh, this is my own fear. It's so much less than what I was experiencing just a moment ago. That was a collective. Now I'm on my own in my own autonomy. I can deal with my fear. I can do this. And that's when the show really started for me all three times. I think the next deep, deep measure that I took was anywhere in my life that I needed to forgive anyone myself, the collective, ancestral forgiveness. I just went deep into forgiveness because I knew absolutely the cancer was caused because of the actions of other people. And so they were the first people that I had to forgive deeply. And it worked on a quantum level. It absolutely worked which is a fascinating story. But as I was going through all of this, I, I work with psychics over the years and the ones that I are super ridiculously, profoundly, immeasurably tuned in. And still I'm very skeptical, right? And so there was an instance where I, I had a kind of an emergency meeting with my psychic. We got on the phone one day 
and there was this topic attached to the whole child, um, the whole alienation piece. And, and I didn't say a word about everything that had just gone down, but I knew there was some big shifts and, and she is the one who just, she was speechless. She, she just, after the forgiveness work I had done the week before, she, she couldn't say anything. And she finally said, oh my gosh, it went away. We're on the phone. And I'm just waiting for her to make another, you know, um, exhale or something. She's just quiet. And then she said, oh, it went to peace. Yep. I said, yep, it went to peace. And then she's quiet again. She goes, oh, he forgave you. And that right there, the quantum effect of all the deep forgiveness work that I have been do doing around the father of my children, deep forgiveness work. I had no idea it would have a quantum effect. In this story, I will tell over and over and over how important it is to do our work because it's not just for us individually. It happens everywhere else in humanity, not just for us. We could, we could no doubt do a show just on forgiveness. Oh my however, God. however um, I think it's important enough to take a few more minutes to really, to ask you um, how, how do you forgive someone how did you go through that? How did you get there? Because, you know, we, we hear in church, we hear in synagogue, we hear at home, we hear in school. You have to learn how to forgive. Right? Yeah. How do you do it? But, but, but there's, no, there's no roadmap. There's no blueprint. It's just like, right. is it like a light switch? Okay. And then for those that are struggling with the forgiveness process, then they go to guilt and shame. A large extent of the time, we go to guilt and shame. Because it's like, how bad of a person can I be that I don't have it in my heart space to forgive that person that hurt me so badly, that I allowed to hurt me so badly. No one has the power to hurt me that badly unless I give it to them, right? But so therein lies, you know, the million dollar question, like, how did you go from a week ago um, not, not being there with your medium to the next week, she affirmed that you had done some significant healing work on forgive forgiven the father of your children well that's a good question jay and it is forgiveness work is not for the faint of heart we're talking about needing to forgive two people who had so dramatically detrimented my relationship as mother to my little itty bitty baby so you're asking mama bear to stand down and that's not easy mama bear stand down and forgive because as like some predator has come after her baby cubs because the alienation piece it's more about child abuse than it is to alienating the suffering the other parent it's child abuse to the worst most insidious degree you're you're asking those children to not only just don't love your other the parent you need to start hating them now because they're not safe, right? So to face that level of extreme was difficult. And I'd been doing prayers of forgiveness. There's a man, I will just say, www.howardwills.com is a phenomenal healer. He lives in Kauai and he was downloaded these prayers when he was 17, I believe the story goes very much like the ho, 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 no pono prayers in Hawaii. I can't say it, but he didn't even you live did in Hawaii. You did better than me. You did better <laughs> than me. That's good. good it's enough. more, it's, it's like, I love you. Please forgive me. Let's all forgive uh -huh. each other. Let's all love right. each other, love, love ourselves. And I'd been doing these prayers for about two years and things were continuing to escalate between the children's father and the stepmother and my own household. It, I was basically completely excommunicated. I didn't know that my daughter had had her first menstrual cycle until five weeks after. I didn't know that my daughter had caused a massive four car collision, uh, causing someone to go to the ER 
uh, when she was just driving on her permit. First time she was out on the road uh, solo with her permit, this happened. Um, and I didn't find out about it until two weeks later. I didn't find out that my son wrapped his car around a tree and almost died with a massive head injury. I didn't find out about that until three days later. It, this was nonstop, always constant, I don't belong in the family kind of mothering thing. So for two years, I had been doing forgiveness work and I know better as a shamanic practitioner, we don't send negative dark thoughts to anyone ever. That's dark magic. Don't do it, not ever, not good. Karma sucks, don't ever do it. And so I would always send love, 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 love. Holy fucking shit, you didn't even tell me my daughter just had her period, love you. Love, 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 love. That's all I could do was just send love. No matter how angry, I just would never send that anger out. But I didn't do enough of the deep forgiveness work because one day, about two years into it, my daughter landed in the hospital with a reading of blood sugar off the 700 meter rank at her doctor's. So she should have been in a diabetic coma. Instead, um, she made it, but now she's type 1 diabetes. And if you understand, if you, if you follow Louise Hay's work, um, heal the mind, heal the emotions, heal the body, diabetes is all about loss of sugar in life, the sweetness, loss of sweetness. And even though dad and mom weren't talking anymore, we would send one line not emotionally evolved um, emails about scheduling and pickup times, there was still all this tension. No matter how much forgiveness work I had done, the tension was still there and it caused my daughter to have type one diabetes. And that is when I really dug deep and I went into, again, Howard Wills on his website, he has prayers of forgiveness. You can download them for free. And I just walked through my neighborhood for five days, I walked for a good five, six hours a day with a whole printout in my hand. And I just walk around the neighborhood saying these prayers out loud over and over and over for five or six hours a day until about day five, I felt this grace, the grace that settled in. There's no other word I can put to it. It's just this deep grace. And I knew something shifted. And it was about three days, four days later that I had my psychic. There were other things that happened that absolutely proved that the forgiveness worked, absolutely worked. Everything shifted in the court system. We came into complete agreement and signed off on, we'll never come back here again. And then the psychic told me a day later that it all went to peace. And then my kids came back to me immediately yeah. immediately and then uh, to carry that even further as far as proof goes my kids are both swimmers they've been in the pool since they were little kids many hours a day swimming training blah -de blah by the time they were in high school they're in the water a good five six hours a day the girls by the time high school would come along they would all get their periods or cycles within an hour of each other because wa water is such a conduit right Within an hour, they'd all be flowing. And one day, my daughter called me out of the blue, out of the blue, and she's a teenager. And girls, kids, teenagers don't call their mom out of the blue unless they want something, right? Yes. She didn't even, want it. Even in your 20s. Exactly. She didn't want anything. She just called the chat. And I'm uh, all I could do is try to calm my heart down and get the smile. I mean, I'm just smiling from ear to ear and just listening Beautiful. to her. And you know what she said is not just, I just had a call in the chat. She also said, mom, it's so weird. I just got my period today. So now understand that what diabetic kid at that age, they had to put her on birth control to regulate her cycles because her blood sugar had her all over the place. 
she was so in mayhem, physical, chemical mayhem, that every time she'd get her cycle, it would throw her blood sugar way off. So they had to regulate it completely, even though she wasn't, it wasn't about sexual activity. It was about regulating her cycles. Mm-hmm. And so the minute she went on birth control, she went like on a dime every month, get her period, like no problems, everything on cycle, complete on schedule for years. And she calls me out of the blue and said, mom, it's so weird. I just got my period and it's two weeks early. I couldn't have gotten it at a stranger hour. I've never been late. I've never been thrown off. Well, that day I had just started my period. And we live as the crow flies about six miles away from each other. And we're not in the pool every day, but we're bonded. And that told me how deep the forgiveness work worked. That's beautiful. Yeah. I want to thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, what you described, if I may paraphrase you, is what some refer to as biohacking. You biohack through prayers, um, through repetitive prayers, through repetitive um, words. You were able to rewire your brain to where you went from uh, the, those thoughts of all those unhealthy, toxic, emotional feelings, including the biggest one, injustice, the feeling of injustice. Yeah. Um, you were able to biohack your thoughts, change the way you felt literally through repetitive um, wording, words, prayers. Uh, I call them, I like to refer to them as tantras. I do that every single morning when I'm out in nature for two or three hours. Um, I have a number of different tantras that I do for myself, by myself, and I say them out loud. And uh, I know this is that when I'm done going through that cycle of, as part of my spiritual practice, I feel a whole lot better than when I first got to out in nature, to the trail. Yeah. So I know it works. It's been working for me for four years. Um, I had my own, we all have a backstory. I had my own backstory um, of a lot of uh, hurt, wounds, deep, deep, deep wounds that went back decades. And through the process of consistently showing up, consistently showing up in um, what I refer to today as non-negotiables for myself, I have learned how to heal, heal my heart. You know, I had a heart attack when I was 48 for a good reason, but I didn't get the message. I missed the signpost. So I had to get it. I had to have more disease progress as yours did. Instead of it just being arteries at the heart that was shutting down. Six years later, I had both my iliac arteries and my legs. My right leg was 99% blocked. Wow. My left was 90. My aorta was 29%. And uh, my heart, my arteries from my heart, uh, the stent was no longer working. I needed additional stents there. So uh, although the disease came at us differently, mine through, I was diagnosed with a very rare blood clotting uh, autoimmune disorder that was causing havoc throughout my body. Yours came out through, uh, through breast cancer. Not once, not twice, but three times. Three. What I'd like to do in the spirit of time uh, is, is kind of fast forward a little bit, and at least from my perspective, share my understanding of what happened um, the first time around. They did some radiation. They did not do chemo with you. The second um, time you, had, uh, you were diagnosed with cancer, you had surgery, uh, double mastectomy, if I'm correct. Is that right? Yeah. Uh-huh. And yes. again, at, at this time, uh, no chemo again. The second time they said no chemo and you were very grateful for that. Did they do radiation a second time? No, radiation the second time would have uh, collapsed all the tissues. So that's why they had to do a mastectomy. They had to apparently, according to the oncologist. So there wasn't um, a second round of radiation wasn't an option. Okay, so now, Fast forward to July of 18, 
um, you, you have some kind of illness, you go for some testing um, and you end up finding out, well, it's your story. Why don't you pick up where I just left <laughs> off? Well, I thought it was walking pneumonia and I really, really, everything pointed to walking pneumonia and I was completely, you know, um, ignoring the symptoms of possible lung cancer because it just wasn't, I, I wasn't willing to allow my psyche to uh, provide for another round of cancer. And so it was walking pneumonia. Well, I couldn't breathe. And I finally went for a chest x-ray. I didn't have insurance at the time. And um, so I was just really afraid of the costs, you know, just put me on antibiotics, that'll knock it out, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, the antibiotics didn't do anything. So I finally went back and I was really having a hard time breathing. They did the checks as chest x-ray, which by the way, as a, what do they call it? A self pay. The doctor said, just tell them your self pay, go to the pharmacist and ask them if they will discount. Ask your doctor, ask the radiologist if he'll discount the chest x-ray. The chest x-ray, all that waiting around, it only cost $58. And then the, the, you know, the antibiotics, when I said, well, I'm a self-pay antibiotics, it was $118. And, and they said, oh, self-pay, well, let's reduce that to $38. So that, that's a little interesting little sidebar. But anyway, it turned out that uh, with the test x-ray revealed that I had 90% of the right lung filled with fluid. So they admitted me to the hospital immediately. Uh, the ER and they started to drain that lung over the course of they couldn't drain it immediately all at once or else it would have mm -hmm. collapsed but it was nearly a gallon of milk <laughs> that's a lot it was three liters of fluid so it's not quite a gallon but it's a lot a lot yeah. and so six days later they, they let me go I had uh, lung surgery the surgeon came back and um, said they, he'd biopsied and found that there was cancer cells encasing the entire right lung and it's inoperable and wouldn't I like to start chemotherapy immediately. And so I, I told the chemotherapist guy that I wasn't interested and they just turned around and it's amazing how fast they, they leave you alone when you say that. Um, and then they just sent me home after six days and I immediately went into my own protocols knowing that, well, the first two times with Western medical obviously didn't work. I had cancer inside of my breast, which didn't make any sense because I didn't have any breast tissue left. So what's up with that? You know, so the PET scan a week later showed, um, the entire right lung, um, the, the lung is, is encased in a sac, which is called the pleural, which allows the fluid and, and the breathing and everything. So this sac called the pleural itself was encased entirely in cancer cells. And the PET scan also showed cancer inside the right lung, cancer inside the right breast. Uh -huh, no tissue, that's weird. And cancer in the T5 and the sternum which is the direct entry from that, that the heart center is at T5 in the sternum, in the bone, right? And so, okay, so basically metastatic stage four inoperable, now what? Well, Western medical didn't work the first two times. I'm doing it on my own. I'm not doing chemo. That was my absolute no way, will never poison my body that way. So one of the first things I did was, I, um, I found myself at Hoxie Biomedical Clinic in Pioana, which is a cancer clinic. They treat all sorts of different ailments or just basic physical um, stuff. And they sent me home with tonics. It's just a day trip. You're there from nine until 4.30 in the afternoon. So very simple. I also went into um, past life regression therapy, knowing that, okay, so I got myself into it. I can get myself out of this. I went into immediately, it was all within the first week, I went into an electronic frequency device treatment 
which oscillates the cells in between the, the frequencies so that the cells die, no matter what the ailment is, Lyme disease or cancer or whatever it might be. Um, and I also, I, I, as a shamanic practitioner, all the way, you know, first diagnosis and second diagnosis and now third diagnosis, the first thing, of course, is I knew this is an emotional hit. And so I needed to do emotional detoxing, whatever it meant, shamanic ritual, therapy, session, whatever this is. I did um, psilocybin, which is magic mushroom therapy. And that was about reminding myself, my intention for that sacred plant ceremony was, I wanted to remind myself why I love life so much. And that plant gave me many, many representations of why I love being in my body. I also, um, since 2011, I began growing my own medical cannabis garden. I absolutely, no hundred, hundred percent, no question in my mind, cannabis cures many cancers, definitely breast cancer. And so I have plenty of supplies in my garden and oil concentrates. So I started my oils. What else did I do? So many things that I dove into, just good, clean living. I, I, I went to probably 90% and I'm still on about 90, 90%, 95% all organic, um, maybe 80 to 90% gluten-free. So cleaned up my diet. Um, lots of juicing, fresh organics. I still partake in animal protein. My body really responds to animal protein. I cannot personally, I can't do an all plant, plant-based diet. I, I would leave the planet. Uh, I believe the, the, the animal protein keeps me grounded here. Uh, what else did I do? I'm, I'm not remembering what else I did. What about dairy? Did you take dairy out or is dairy still in? Oh, I, you know what? I was raised in the East and the Midwest, which is all dairy. So I have a good five pounds of cheese in my refrigerator at all times. But okay. what I did was I switched to, I, um, I, I made sure that my water source is reverse osmosis filtration system in my house. And I also... Um, have a distillery, a distiller. So I distill my water as well. So I'm in between RO water and distilled water. So it's super clean. And I always have craved water with lemons. So um, the lemons help to um, pH balance the whole body system in case I'm, you know, I, I tend to cheat a little. Hoxie asks that we don't eat tomatoes and vinegar, which Vinegar is in everything. It's in mayonnaise. It's in every salad dressing. It's like the perfect everything in food. And I've cheated a lot. Meanwhile, I have very little cancer left in my body. And I really believe it's a lot to do with attitude. But after that July diagnosis in 2018, my next PET scan in November, showed that it the cancer had proliferated throughout my body it was it was more i mean it had so encased my lung that i was leaning to the right side because it was so tight it was like an iron fist it was also the pet scan showed cancer cells inside the left lung now as well as inside the right inside the left breast as well inside the right and up and down the spine more than anything. Um, and then somehow everything turned around at the beginning of the year. What I did do, the only thing that I've done that resembles Western medical is after that horrific PET scan in November that showed it was all over the place and in my liver, um, I called my doctors at the Hoxie Clinic right away and said, here's what the PET scan shows, what do I do? And they had me go down there immediately, um, within days. It was absolutely immediately. And they had they tested me out 
and they sent me home with new tonics. But what they also said, the oncologist down there said, you must go on hormone blockers. You must. And they had said this to me before in July, but I was so not interested in taking tamoxifen that because my body had so repelled, um, totally revolted against the tamoxifen when I tried to take it in 2012. And again, maybe for a month in 2014, it just wasn't a good idea for my body. The bottle just, it had a skull and crossbones for me. And so when the Mexican oncologist, he said to me, you need to take hormone blockers. Well, Mexico is allowed to cure cancer and they're not owned by big pharma. So I trusted them. So I did, I went on something called exomestane, which is a better version, a more potent version of tamoxifen with way less side effects. So there's a lot that I did. I also started chaga mushroom, which my first uh, intuition with the diagnosis was get my immune system. I am so sickly and weak, get my immune system booted up. So the first thing I did uh, back in July or it was late July in 2018, right after that diagnosis is I went into treatment uh, for IV infusion of vitamin C drip every week, thinking that the vitamin C would boost my immune system. Everything that I've been reading on vitamin C is we need it and our bodies don't produce enough of it and it's necessary. But then I found I wasn't really, for the expense and the time involved, I wasn't seeing any kind of an improvement every week that I came out of my vitamin C IV drips. Somehow, I just got this huge thing in my face around chaga mushroom, C-H-A-G-A, -A, chaga mushroom. And it has, it has higher amounts of antioxidants than acai berry and vitamin C to the, I mean, almost 20 times higher. And so I immediately stopped vitamin C drips and I went on to taking chaga tea, which I, I like to produce myself. I like to, everything that goes in my body, I like to know who's processed it, what the process is, that it's as toxin free as possible. So of course I had to process myself and do my own extraction of the chaga, but I have not been sick, not even a sniffle or a cough for a year and a half. It's pretty how, amazing. How, how many times a day were you drinking a chaga? Uh, well, I started taking two and three cups a day because, you know, at first I, I, I get a little OCD about things, you know? And so about a week or two into it, I realized it was a little much because I had literally, I've seen people go through psychological breaks. I've seen it. I know what it looks like. It's not me but I've witnessed it and it's not pretty. Well, after about a week or two of taking two or three cups of chaga tea mushroom every day, I nearly had a break, nearly. It was very edgy. And I realized all at once, I have to back off. And the reason why, of, why this is happening is because it's so detoxifying, it was, shoving everything out of my emotional system at such a rapid rate. I almost had a break. So I, I only take one cup a day now. I would, I would recommend go slow. Yeah, I, uh, I, we have chaga. We have chaga in the home. We've been on it for probably close to a year now. Uh, typically, I had my cup today. Uh, it's not every day. Mary has it pretty consistently every day. Um, but yeah, we, uh, I didn't know that it can actually be, a, have a, a significant impact on treating cancer, healing cancer. Oh, yes. Um, when I heard about it, I, I started to research. There's a man who wrote a book called The Cancer Ward in the 1950s. And he won at, it was either Pulitzer or Nobel Prize for Literary 
on that book. He visited a village in Siberia who was taking chaga mushroom. And this village, he went there specifically because of their health, um, how healthy they are because of the chaga. And um, it was found in this village in Siberia. Chaga mushroom grows on the sides of birch trees as a fungus in very cold regions of the world. So he went to this village in Siberia hearing that their lifespan is 80 to 100 years old and they never, ever, ever admitted anyone from their village into hospital for cancer. They heard wow. about cancer, but they'd never been treated anyone in their village. Meanwhile, the village down the river, no, this is the 1950s, right? But so same region, not a whole lot of technology, basically the same food sources. The only difference is the village down the river never took chaga. The village up the river had been taking chaga for about 400 years. And in fact, that was their um, the alternative to, to tea or coffee. They were basically saving money, but also they felt really good and really healthy when they were taking this as a tea. So no cancer, um, really high um, um, age limit. It's and the 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 the, the age a life expectancy of the village down the river who wasn't taking chaga, by the way, they were only living until 40 or 50 years old, as opposed to 80 to 90 years old. Wow. Only get, different. Get your chaga. Listen, yes. listen to what Jackie's saying here. Chaga, you could buy on Amazon. Uh, you could, you, there's so many, there are brands out there, a go organic. <laughs> um, if you want a resource, uh, PM me. I'll be happy to share what what we use. We're not we're not make we're not making our own the way Jackie is. We're not quite there yet, but you know, yeah. baby steps, big priority. Um, that's amazing, Jackie. I appreciate you sharing that little tidbit on that chaga. There's so many different uh, products out there. There's so many different alternative modalities and strategies and products uh, that. So many people, you mentioned um, medical cannabis, huge, powerful, used in most of the, I believe many of the treatment, alternative treatment centers down in Mexico. If they're not using it, they're suggesting it as part of your protocol when you get back home. I, I know Kate Malvin has been a three-time guest on this show. Um, it's been a huge part. She was given six months a year ago, October, and she today is, as of two weeks ago, NED, and uh, she also um, learned how to make her own medical cannabis, and uh, she's cancer-free today, uh, also metastasized lung cancer. But with what time we have left today, I would like to invite you, uh, because I had a teaser on the marketing piece for this, for this uh, episode today, that we were going to deep dive into sacred sexuality. Uh, and uh, you said to me earlier today, you kind of blindsided me. I didn't see it coming. I didn't, I didn't uh, have no idea that we were going to go there until you said to me that sacred sexuality is, the, is one of the protocols that you're using to heal the last cancer that is in your bones, if I understood you correctly. Yes. So... In March, everything turned around back in March. And um, the cancer is basically out of all of those regions of my body now, except for in the bone, a little bit up and down the spine. So I, I had a healing session with a man who dives deep into Akashic Records work. And I, I had said, well, the cancer is all about this emotional hit in my heart center, my kids, my babies, you know, this happened and it broke my heart. And, I, and, and so can you tell me, the session was all about, let's look at the cancer, let's see what it's all about. And he said, you know, it doesn't have anything, what's in the bones now has nothing to do with the children aspect, that emotional hit that you took at the heart level. The cancer in the bones has to do with early childhood sexual trauma. And I went bingo. 
So yeah, I experienced, unfortunately, a massive amount of years since the time I was, um, I can only say from perspective wise, I was a toddler. I couldn't quite see over the sink. I had to step on my tippy toes to see over the sink, uh, to see what my grandfather was making me see. Um, and that's when it all started, the sexual trauma. And it was, you know, riddled through my family. I was raped by my brothers for years and years and years. And then uncles and cousin, uncle cousins and neighbors. And it just seemed like the door was wide open when I was young for every pedophile in the neighborhood to come visit me. And so all boundaries were shattered for me. I had no representation of safety. And the, the ones who were supposed to support me and protect me were raping me and my family, my brothers. Um, my mother wasn't there to protect me. She actually offered me up to her father as a tasty little treat. Um, for his own satisfaction. And so imagine that's a lot of shame and grief and guilt. And we all know that that saying, we know it in our bones, our bones hold the truth. How many ways can we say that our bones hold the stories of our lives, of our souls? And so when this Akashic Records healer said this, it makes absolute sense the amount of shame and guilt and just dirty, filthy, nasty sinner that my church told me I was going to burn in hell for forever having my little body touched, even though I was a tiny little creature and I had no say in it. All that is still in my bones. And that makes all the sense in the world. So I started to dive into sacred sexuality and I'd gone through um, healing in the sexual realms about 12 years ago. I started that journey when I had healed every aspect in my life, except for that big piece. It was like in a dark shoe box in the, in the darkest corner of my closet. And I just didn't want to look at it until I finally just couldn't ignore it anymore. So I took the show box out and I started my healing journey and then I, you know, over the course of years, I found myself on a healing table. Some dear friends of mine that we befriended. I love their work. I'm now teaching and training with them with um, it's uh, somatic sexological work. So in congruency with shamanic work, going through sexual healing is basically the last frontier. Most people will heal every other aspect of their lives, but societal conditioning around the world has us so afraid of sexuality. As far as being a woman, we aren't even allowed to say the word, let alone pleasure for ourselves, right? So I've taken a deep dive into re retelling my story and reclaiming my birthright for absolute sexual sensual pleasure which by the way since the time I was a little girl I knew I was a high priestess from past lives I knew there is much more to this whole sexual piece than what these boys are doing to my body there's so much more to the preciousness of sexuality for us as human beings to be able to witness and appreciate and adore and embody, embody in our own bodies and then pass on to our children. And the world would change so dramatically if we just talked to our children about the sacredness of sexuality and sensuality and how to create clear boundaries and what we want and what we don't want. So I started literally, because I don't have a significant partner in my life, a romantic sexual partner, and I'm very discerning. I can't just go out and ha have sex with somebody for that the enjoyment. It's not enjoyable to me. However, the field of emotionality and especially sensuality, sexuality is the most potent human vibration we could possibly ever carry. 
especially when it comes to healing. When we focus on positive emotions, love and embracing and potent sexuality in the moments of climax is the most potent magical space that we could possibly tap into for our own healing and the healing of the world. And so because I don't have a significant partner, I started going to sex clubs, which a year before I was in such massive dark judgment over people. What my thing was, these people are going to sex clubs are just out there fucking random strangers and it's so disgusting and revolting. Well, you know what? There's something there for everyone. And mostly what I found is I can be there and witness other people making love or fucking or tying each other up, being in a place that's filled with this beautiful field of sexuality and sensuality. And what I witnessed is these people are in their full bloom. They're in their full expression of who they choose to be without worrying about judgment. They're in absolute sexual expression. And these people are powerhouses in the world. They stand strong in what they do in life, the companies they represent, the companies they run, the families they hold together, and they're in their full bloom sexually. Not only that is it's one of the most safest places to be because it's a matriarchal system. It's a feminine, feminine centric versus patriarchal system where no man can ever go solo. He can only go accompanied by a woman. This means every man in the room is completely satiated and it's the safest place for me to be. And so if I'm in a place where people are making love and I can witness the field of sexuality and just be embraced in this potent energy of sexuality and sensuality, my body is being reinformed, retold a brand new story about healthy sexuality and sensuality without having being touched by a stranger. And meanwhile, so that's my early journey. There are so many other deep dives that I've taken into sacred sexuality, but I had said to you earlier, my relationship with sexual, sacred sexuality is my own. It's how I approach sexuality as the sacred. It's not about somebody else's definition of what sacred sexuality looks like, just as Tantra in the Western world has basically been bastardized because it's been kind of recondensed into something about sex. And Tantra is never about sex. It's about a philosophy of being in life with all of life, where now the same thing with my own sexuality just because somebody else has labeled it sacred sexuality, it's my terms with my own sexuality. And my approach is sacred to my sexuality. And damn it, it's fucking fun. My bones are being reinformed with this new juicy, yummy energy. When I'm in, because I'm not in sacred, I'm gonna say it, I'm gonna say it, Jay, but because I'm not in sacred relationship, with a man, with my beloved, then I have to, I keep up my own, my own solo practice, my self-pleasuring. I do my best to self-pleasure every day. It doesn't really work out that way because I'm on such a hormone cocktail that it, I'm just, my body doesn't do what it used to do. But even, even in my practice, when I do my practice at the height of climax, I integrate sex magic into the height of climax. So at every orgasm, I am cancer free. I'm healthy, I'm vibrant, I'm alive. This is my mantra. And at, when we practice sacred sex magic, there is nothing that can stand in the way with those mantras 
that are given to the universe in that moment. Well, we have one thing in common. I, I, uh, I, I do my mantras in nature. Uh, I haven't done it through sacred sexuality, um, but I definitely can relate to it because I know how it feels when I'm in nature, as I described earlier in our conversation, and, uh, and I've got my mantras going. Uh, it's a different type of orgasm, no doubt. Um, but I tell you what, it feels pretty damn good in yeah. nature. Um, wow, what a, uh, we, we could go, we could have, well, there's a few, we could, I'm going to have to have you back as a guest because we could spend a whole hour just on, on this topic. We could also, um, there's so many different, different paths we could go down. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you sharing this part of your story. It takes a lot of courage. It takes someone who's at peace with where they're at in their own healing journey to speak your truth. I know yeah. that the truth is all that matters. And when we're at peace with who we are and where we are in this complicated journey of living, um, it feels like it takes less courage to do what you're doing tonight. You just show up. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's it. You just show up. Now, let me ask you this. Um, on a sacred sexuality piece, how, how has it changed or impacted your life since you embraced this, we'll call it healing modality for cancer? Um, wowie. I would never want to meet the woman that I was before in the mirror. I was never happy with her. I had, before visiting sacred sexuality, I was collapsed, hiding under big t-shirts afraid of being in my sex in my body as a woman because it's just fucking fearful being a woman is my story in my life it's gonna hurt i'm going to be i'm gonna be dismantled because i'm a woman i'm gonna be raped i'm gonna be you know all of this now when i go out in the world i'm happy and i'm free i have no gardenness around my heart I dress the way I want to dress. I shine the way I want to shine. I smile at people and they smile back. So the gift of my shine and my light is there, right there on the surface in order to inspire other people to shine their own lights. Um, as a now a fully, like fully turned on sexual woman, I can walk into the world fully turned on. I mean, I don't mean horny as hell. I mean, turned the fuck on in a way that everybody wants to engage with that energy. Um, not everybody, but those who enjoy, it's like watching a butterfly fly by. Whoa, look at all the pretty colors. I don't have to guard myself from being that butterfly anymore. I can be fully out. I can show my face. I can um, immerse myself in all the pleasures. So, so our second chakra is our sex chakra. It's our pleasure center. It's the center that we have for play and life. So it's not just as an artist, I'm far more effective creating on canvas now. I'm far more effective in being in my play and life. And yeah, being in my sex also and being fully turned on all the time, all day long. And it, it's not every day, all day, every day, all day long, but I do my best to give myself permission to be there. And so it's almost like a quest. It's like, how do we cook the best turkey for Thanksgiving? We brine it so it's super moist. We check in with the temperature. So I'm checking in with my body and how I feel and how clothing drapes on me just so, not for other people, but for me. 
And when I'm turned on for me, then I'm turned on for a whole lot of other people. And I know that my turn on is absolutely melting the cancer right out of the bones. Beautiful, beautiful. Quick question on that, and, uh, and we're gonna wrap this show up. Are your children aware of this part of your healing journey? Have you just shared it with them? Have you disclosed it with them? Um, if, if not, why? If yes, uh, why? They, I have not been direct with them. They understand that I am a somatic sexological worker. They totally get the shamanic piece. They know their mom is a complete hippie. I bring up sex all the time and free, you know, just like just free body awareness. Like they know I'll go to clothing optional events and they, they, I don't know if they're judging me anymore, um, but they, they hear through my prayer circles when I do my emails to my prayer groups where I'm at, but we haven't had a direct conversation about it. It's been a, there have been broken links to our ability to be super close in every way all the time. And I have to dance very carefully around those broken links because they're still in repair. Yep. You know what I mean? Yes, After I do. Years, they're still in repair. Yep, I understand. So They'll, they'll find out. They'll know. I'm not afraid, but it's just all in good time. Yeah. You know, I, the reason I asked that question was more so from the perspective of, um, I think one of the greatest gifts that we can give our children today as we are awakening on our healing journey is sharing as a mentor so that, so that they don't have to spend as many years, let's right. say, living in pain or suffering. There are things that we have found or find that have brought lightness, have brought empowerment, bring freedom to us. Why not share it? We'll know when it's the right time to share those moments with our children um, but as you described, you know, it, it's, it's, it's bringing together a fractured relationship and therein lies where we get to learn how to trust our intuition yeah. and know when it's the right time to connect with our children at that next level, whatever that, whatever that may look like. Um, I understand that. I respect you for that and the, the beautiful journey that you shared with, with us this evening uh, was just incredible. Um, I want to thank you for that. And I'd like to invite you to perhaps put a pretty bow on the show and close us out with your, your thoughts that someone else may hear this evening that may resonate with them and help inspire them to continue their own healing journey. Oh, well, well, thank you, Jay. I, um, I am in such humility and gratitude for life. This is all that I can think to impart is every day is precious, even in the face, even and even and especially in the face of critical ailments and illness and disease. We have the ability to choose the way our brains work and choose our thoughts. We can choose our destiny. I believe this to the core of my body. I also believe in the power of prayer and support from others. I'm not a religious person at all. I'm very spiritual, but I absolutely believe in the power of prayer and bounding together with my own cancer journey, I refused. And to this day, I have not put this out in Facebook. And it's been how many years? Eight, almost nine years now. And I have not broadcast it with a bunch of random strangers. Only, only did I call on 
those in my life who have the highest amounts of faith that I trust in, who would only see me as healthy and vibrant and surviving this. Because to put it out in random, you know, media land, you've just got a bunch of random strangers seeing you dying. I don't, I don't believe that's healthy at all. I believe in declaring our own destiny and our own level of prayers. And oh my gosh, being our own health advocates, listening to doctors, doctors definitely save lives in Western medical, but the whole cancer system is very suspicious in this country, to say the very least, as I'm sure anyone would agree with. And so be your own advocate. I'd be happy to mail out any, and to anybody who has questions, what my protocols have been. I know that my protocols have saved my life and everyone has their own protocols. Everyone has their own callings. It's whatever resonates with each individual and believe in it, get rid of the fear and believe in it. And I tell you what, the shamanic work absolutely works. You've got to have some energy work along with all of the, the physical detoxing, liver detoxing, whatever it takes. But the emotional detoxing is absolutely imperative in the face of critical ailment or at life in general. Jackie Coburn, thank you so much for, for having the courage to step into the studio. And to share your story, I, um, I want to just close by saying that um, I believe from my own healing journey that the greatest gift that we can give to ourselves is just becoming our own advocate, not putting all of our faith and trust into someone outside of ourselves. Utilize Western medicine for what your intuition tells you is best for you, not what other people outside of yourself think is best for you because they're coming from love, but they're coming from fear and they are not walking through the actual illness or disease. And so what I've learned through my own healing journey is to do my research, ask the questions, and then make my own conscious decisions from listening to what I refer to as my inner voice, knowing what's best for me, even when it is adverse to what society deems as the right thing to do. And I do believe today that if I had listened to the majority of those comments, I would not be here this evening with you. I would not be alive today. And so I too have learned how to trust myself, have trust in God. I lean into faith today rather than fear on most days. I am human, so I have my moments of weakness. It just means I up level my game and I get busier. Um, but through it all, what I have learned and what you have learned and continue to learn is behind all disease is emotional scars, emotional wounds. If we want to heal disease, um, there's not enough chemo, there's not enough radiation, and there's not enough surgeries that will prevent that cancer from coming back if you yeah. haven't done the emotional part of healing. Bingo. And so with that, um, and that's a journey. That's a, I think it's a lifetime, you know, where I don't know that we're ever done no. releasing and healing, but as long as we show up for ourselves just for today, we have a pretty good chance that we're going to awaken tomorrow. Right. Yeah. And with that, um, Thank you so much for joining us this evening. If you catch us live or in replay, uh, we appreciate you supporting this show this evening. Without you, we wouldn't, wouldn't have a reason to be here. So uh, thank you so much for that. Enjoy your weekend. And no matter what you got going on this weekend, put down that to-do list 
and take time for yourself, do some self-care and um, take time to enjoy that time alone by yourself, get to know who you are, listen to what your needs are and take care of that little child inside. And with that, thank you so much for joining us this evening on Real People, Real Health. We'll catch you uh, next week. Thank you so much. My name is Jay Rothman.